Right, we're going to cover a lot of material. Oh dear. We're going to cover a lot of material in a short amount of time, because we only have a short amount of time, but also the idea is to give you an overview, and maybe you'll make links between the different areas of mechanics that you hadn't appreciated before. That, if that happens, that would be a good thing. Anyway, what I'm going to look at today is motion, I'm going to focus on motion. So we'll be covering units, vectors, velocity, displacement, acceleration, force, and then we'll finish up on projectiles. If there's anything that you want me to clarify for you, then just go ahead and ask. I will give a few worked examples throughout the course of the presentation as well. Okay? So let's get started. First up, we've got units, and in particular, Système International units, SI units. We need to use units because... If I just give you a number, for example, the length of this table is 1.2, then you're like 1.2 what? And you need something to set that number into context, and that's what units enable us to do. So they give meaning to our numerical values. All right? What we have in SI are a series of base units, and from those base units you can derive other units. So the base units are meters for length, seconds for time, kilograms for mass, kelvin for temperature, ampere for current, and candela for luminance. Right, those are your base units. In, in addition to that, you have uh, units based on those like meters per second, meters per second squared, kilograms, meters per second, and so on. So you have derivations of those. Then, the, the, what work with units, but are not units themselves, are prefixes. Prefixes are a shorthand way of writing very large numbers and very small numbers. So we're looking to talk about 1,000 metres as kilometres, or a thousandth of a metre as a millimetre. So you've got the ones that you need to know, femto, pico, nano, micro and milli, you would obviously need to know centi, but the ones that I gave you before centi, they would go up in threes, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 3, centi is 10 to the minus 2. And then for large numbers, so going, well, I'm ascending here, you've got kilo, mega, giga, tera. You probably, if you buy a new computer, you'll be familiar with some of those numbers anyway. So when I bought, when I bought um, a computer, 8 megabytes of RAM, that was good. That was, these days you need like 8 gigabytes, so that's a thousand times larger. Just goes to show you how far we've moved, but, but that may be because I'm very old. Okay, so those are prefixes. That's the list of them there. Sorry? Scalars and vectors, right? So, scalars and vectors are two different types of quantity that we've got. I've listed some over here. Scalars, they just have a size. We've got distance, speed, mass, energy, power, pressure. Those are scalars. They just have a number. They don't have a direction like vectors. Okay? So, vectors. They will have a magnitude as well, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, power, but they also have direction. Okay. Time, yeah, time is a scalar, it's a good one to put in there. Very fundamental unit. Or quantity. Um, this, this direction is important when you add vectors, because the direction means that, for example, if you have one vector quantity in one direction, the same vector quantity in another direction, when you add those two quantities, you need to subtract them. And if they're not linear, that means if they're not acting along a line, but they're acting at an angle, um, or various angles, then you would need to take in, 
into account that direction by means of trigonometry or Pythagoras. And the other thing is, you know, a ve if you've got a vector quantity, like a bullet with a velocity, right, you know that it's bad times if that bullet is moving towards you, right? And the velocity may indicate that. But it's not such bad times if it's moving away from you, okay? And that would be indicated by the direction of the vector. Also, you know, when you're adding vectors in aircraft, it's important because that's this vector addition allows you to take into account the effect of crosswinds. So a plane is coming in, it has a velocity, and the wind acting on the plane gives the plane a velocity which is perhaps perpendicular to the plane, plane's velocity. So then you can take that into account by vector addition and you can work out where the plane will actually end up moving. When you add vectors, you add them head to tail. So I'll give you some examples of what that would actually look like. And negatives are there as an indicator of direction. Let's take two vectors here. Vectors we represent by arrows. So the head, when I say the head of a vector, I'm talking about the arrow head. And the tail is the opposite end. Okay? So this vector has a size represented by the length of the arrow and the direction indicated by the direction it's pointing. If I add those, then you note that I kept the, the length of both arrows exactly the same as before. That length was exactly the same as what I had when they were separate. And I kept the orientation of them exactly the same as well. So this was vertical, it's still vertical. This was at this angle, maybe about 45 degrees. It's at the same angle. So you, when you add vectors head to tail by drawing one vector, and then adding the other one on so that the tail meets the head, you've got to keep the length of them the same and the orientation of them the same. The resultant then starts and ends in the same place. All right? Starts and ends in the same place. So these two, yeah, they're head to head, but I'm not adding them. That one is the, the vector sum of those two. Okay, so we'll go on from scalars and vectors to look more in detail at vectors. You can resolve vectors into horizontal and vertical components. Vector components are vectors that can be added together to give you the resultant vector. Right? That's what I mean by component. You, you can add these two up and get the, res the resultant vector, so that they're the same thing. They both start and finish in the same place, so that means they're the same. And vector components can be added head to tail to give your result vector, as I just said. Components are useful when you're adding together multiple vectors at various angles. If you can break your general vectors down into components, horizontal, vertical, then you can add them together more easily, perhaps. And you'd use trigonometry and Pythagoras to find those components of vectors. So if you take a, take a vector, then you can use, you can draw a right angle triangle by, with that vector as the hypotenuse. So if I show you what I mean, there's a vector, and I can draw the horizontal and vertical by making a right angle triangle with that as the hypotenuse. Okay? And the reason that we use horizontal and vertical is because we're quite used, in a, used to this in our daily life. We're quite used to working in horizontal and verticals. Okay. One example of adding components is working out the resultant velocity in projectile motion. If I resolve this vector, which has got length L or size L and angle theta, then I get 
that. But if I add together these two components, then I get this vector. Okay, so it's at a different angle. You always measure your angle from the horizontal or vertical, whichever is most appropriate for the situation. So here, the horizontal is appropriate, whereas here, from the vertical, is appropriate. Any questions about the components or vectors? No? All right. Motion quantities. So we're looking specifically at the quantities involved with motion here. Um, distance and speed, those are both scalar quantities. They don't have any direction, they just have a size. Displacement velocity and acceleration, they are vectors. You know that we call displacement S. When we talk about distance, we're talking about the length of, that you've actually covered. The ground that you've covered. If you, were, if you were to walk along this very windy path, straighten it all out, measure that, that would be the distance that you've covered. Whereas displacement is a straight line measured from your start point to your end point. And speed, that is related to distance because it is the rate of change of distance. And velocity is related to displacement because it's the rate of change of displacement. And acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. If you walk back and forth, you have to watch out for this. I'll, I'll say it again later. But if I walk over here and then walk back here, what is my final displacement? Zero. You have to watch out for those situations. So what's my average velocity then? Zero. Because it doesn't matter how long it took me to do that, I could have taken 10 minutes doing that, but because the top, the uh, numerator of the, the equation is zero, whatever is on the bottom is going to be zero at the end of the day. V equals S over T, so that's displacement over time, and A is V minus U over T. V in this equation, that's your final velocity, and u is your initial velocity, so it's final minus the initial over time. That means if you have a final velocity which is less than your initial, then you get a negative acceleration, and we call a negative acceleration deceleration. I've already noted that if an object starts and finishes in the same place, then how long it took to do it, a satellite orbiting the Earth, right? Let's say it's a geostationary satellite, so it takes a whole day to orbit the Earth, although its position relative to the surface of the Earth is not changing. That's irrelevant. It did actually cover a lot of ground. Even though it took a whole day, the average velocity was still zero. All right? That's different from its speed. Okay. The motion quantities there. Motion graphs then. Make sure that you check the axes of motion graphs carefully. If you have a displacement time graph, that's S against T, then the gradient of those graphs is your velocity. So let's have a look at some different shapes you can get. Note the S, T. That object is stationary. Its position, its displacement is not changing. This object is at constant velocity. We see the gradient is constant, it's a straight line. So therefore, constant gradient, constant velocity. This object is decelerating. Look how the gradient is changing over time. So it starts off high. So it's got a large positive velocity. It's a steep graph. And then the steepness decreases, the gradient decreases. So therefore the velocity is decreasing, slowing down. Then we have some velocity time graphs. I hope, by the way, I'm not going over every single possibility. I will give you some combined ones after this. So we'll see a variety of different shapes, but I'm not giving you any single one. For velocity time graphs, we need to take note of two features of the graph. 
First one, gradient. Gradient is acceleration now. Second one, area under. We didn't consider the area under for displacement time graphs. That doesn't tell us something that we need to know for AS physics. But uh, in velocity time graphs, they do. So we've got VT. Let's look at some shapes. Constant velocity. The velocity is not changing. What is the gradient of that line? Gradient of that line? Don't be brief. Zero. zero. Zero, right? So, zero acceleration. Zero gradient, zero acceleration, i.e. constant velocity. Constant acceleration. So the gradient is constant at a positive value. This is an increasing acceleration. So, starting off at zero, but then the gradient is increasing, so the acceleration is increasing. Decreasing deceleration. So it's now negative, that's a deceleration because negative gradient, negative acceleration. So it's a deceleration. It's slowing down, but the rate at which it's slowing down is decreasing over time because the magnitude of the gradient is decreasing. Right? Starts off steep, finishes at zero. Alright? Decreasing acceleration. So it starts off positive and large, and reduces to zero gradient. All right, so you've just got to look at what's happening to the gradient to understand what type of motion it is. Watch out for negatives. You've got a, this would go for displacement graphs as well, but here's a velocity time graph. We've got some positive velocity, we've got some negative velocity as well, so you have to watch out for those. Now, if you look at over the left, we've got positive velocity, that's giving us positive displacement because that's the area under. You can have negative displacement, remember, because displacement as a vector quantity means you can have negatives. You can't have a negative distance, but you can have a negative displacement. So it's, it is possible here, if these two areas were equal in size, that you started and finished where? Same place. Because that means you cover the same amount of ground going in one direction as you did going in another direction. And here, if you look at the gradient, this is a positive gradient, right? So, you would think it's accelerating, right? Yeah. But, it's a positive gradient with a negative velocity, meaning they're in opposite directions. Therefore, you've actually, you're actually slowing down. And that kind of makes sense if you look at the fact you're getting towards zero velocity. So you are slowing down. It's a deceleration. All right? Watch out for negatives. Combined motion graphs. So let's put some of those different things together. That's a displacement time graph. There's three aspects to this displacement time graph. Displacement time graph, you're going to look at the gradient, which tells you the velocity. Constant velocity there, it's stationary there, and it's accelerating there. Or some form of acceleration or deceleration. I think it's uh, an acceleration because it starts off stationary here, and then it starts moving, so it must be speeding up. Okay. Velocity time graph. You've got accelerate. Oh, that, was a bit, that was a bit too eager there. Let's go back. Right. I think I've gone back more than. Constant, constant acceleration, constant velocity, and then increasing acceleration. Or, sorry, increasing deceleration. Right? Right? Because the gradient is negative, positive velocity, so it's in opposite directions. Any questions about the graphs? Okay. You alright? The classic catch is circular paths. I kind of hinted at this with the satellite example that I gave. This is an object moving 
at a constant speed in a circle. If it's a constant speed, that does not mean that it's at constant velocity. So these two locations, for example, it has different velocity. You've got V1, V2. So speed is constant, but velocity is changing because the direction is changing. It's always changing. At each point, each point along there, its direction is changing. Okay? So watch out for those. What if you have one revolution, like imagine the end point of the minute hand of a clock. After one hour, it would start and finish at the same place. So you, it's got an average velocity of zero. So watch out for those. Equations of motion. So we come to Subat equations. What we do here is we start with a, a general velocity time graph for one dimensional motion at constant acceleration. And from there we can derive some equations. That's the graph we use. It's an object moving at constant acceleration, hence the straight line. And it's increasing its velocity from u to v over a time t. The first equation we can define from there using the gradient a equals v minus u over t, that is v equals u plus over t. What we did is we started with a equals v minus u over t, which is change in y over change in x, and then rearranged it for, to make it into a form that's easier to remember, v equals u plus over t. Then s equals ut plus a half at squared, you can get that. That's because uh, S, the displacement, is the area under the graph. What we did here is we worked out this area of the triangle and the area of the rectangle. So that you get U, this is U, length U, T, multiply those out, that gives you 1, that's UT. Then the half, half AT squared bit comes from working out this. Half V minus U times t, half base time type for the area of a triangle, and we made a substitution from this equation, because v minus u equals at, so you substitute that in and you get a half at squared. That's the second equation from displacement. Displacement is also equal to the average velocity times time, so if you, the average velocity would be v plus u over a half. Then you can combine two equations to give you this fourth equation. The key thing here is there's no t. So you eliminate t from your equations, and that allows you to have v squared equals u squared plus 2as. The idea with these equations is that in a given problem, you will know three quantities and need to calculate a fourth. So you, you now have a way of doing that with these equations. Because they cover just about every possibility. Not absolutely every single possibility. Acceleration of freefall. You can use this equation, s equals ut plus a half a t squared, and a displacement time graph to calculate the acceleration of freefall. Uh, sorry, that should be an st squared graph. So you've got your st squared graph. You drop an object from various, dis various heights, which is your displacement. You plot t squared for those s's, and you get a straight line through the origin. The, because the object you're dropping starts at an initial velocity of zero, because you're dropping it, that term is equal to zero. Therefore, A is equal to the acceleration of free form, U is equal to zero, S is equal to the height that you're dropping from, uh, so H equals a half GT squared, and the gradient then is equal to a half G, because we've plotted the what, S or H against T squared. 
So if you compare this, because it goes to the origin, the equation of that load would be y equals mx. The y is your s or h, x is t squared, so then the gradient is half g. They rearrange that, work out your gradient, and g is equal to two times the gradient. Okay, so I've looked at motion, I'm going to start looking at forces. Has anyone got any questions about anything I've just covered? No? Alright. Forces. Forces. We have a lot to thank this man for the forces, Newton, Isaac Newton. He lived 1642 to 1727 in England. And um, the actions of forces are primarily covered in A2, but we do actually look at a special case of the second law in AS physics. What forces are, they are influences that tend to cause objects to change their motion or produce stresses. The, as the idea of changing their motion, that's what we're particularly interested at this point in time. Uh, forces produce linear motion, whereas torques produce rotational motion. We'll look at that later on, this rotational motion you can get. Types of forces that you need to be aware of. Weight, normal reaction, either called the NRL. Uh, tension, friction, drag, thrust, lift. Those are some forces that you would need to know about. They're all vectors, and they all have the units of Newtons and one newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. You can see that if you know F equals M A, M K G A meters per second squared. Uh, these forces act on objects and may produce resultant forces. And when we start looking at the special case of Newton's second law, it's the resultant force which we're interested in. And that's you work out the resultant force from vector addition, which we, we looked at right at the beginning. If we take an example of a car, some forces acting on the car. There's a car with mass m. We've got drag and thrust. So you can see in this case, thrust is bigger than drag, and that would give us a result of force, because there's a difference in the size of things. Right. Force and acceleration, that's that special case that I was talking about. Multiple forces may act on objects. Nice, simple example on the left there. F1, F2, got two forces. You can easily tell me, whatever values I gave you, what the result force would be of those cases. You may have more, much more complicated complicated situations like that. It's got five forces acting on it, all at different angles. The way you work out the result force is uh, the, re the result of vector addition. So you add these up head to tail, or you do some resolving horizontal and vertical components and start working out what the total horizontal is and the total vertical. So you see how everything you did at the beginning with vector addition is now helping us solve complicated problems like this. And it's the resultant of these forces which is responsible for accelerating the object, changing the motion of the object, speeding it up, slowing it down, changing its direction. These are changes in motion, and it's the resultant of force which accelerates the object. So, simply, FR may be, should be acting towards the left because F1 is bigger than F2. This one, once you work everything out, may give you a result of force like that, right? And it's, that's, that's the one. For objects with constant mass, then the result force, which we call F, is equal to mass times acceleration. F equals Emma. It's a special case of Newton's second law, this is, because objects may not have constant mass, and Newton's second law takes that into account by uh, the result force being equal to the rate of change of momentum. But we don't cover momentum at AS, and that's why we only deal with this special case. 
if mass, uh, sorry, mass is not constant at speeds approaching the speed of light. So that's a condition that you need to know for the use of FPM. Let's do an example calculation. We've got a mass, 650 kgs. F1, we don't know. F2 is 3 kilonewtons. And the acceleration is 4.3 meters per second squared. We want to find out F1, so the first thing to do is find out what the resultant force is. Resultant force is equal to mass times acceleration. I'm calling, just for clarity, I'm calling the resultant force F subscript R. And FR is equal to 2.8 kilonewtons. Right? That is 650 times 4.3. Hopefully it is anyway. I may have done this calculation late at night, so maybe wrong. Alright, FR then is equal to the result of the forces. And I have to do that by vector addition in this nice linear example here. That's very easy. It's just that take away that, isn't it? F1 take away F2. So FR is F1 take away F2. If I rearrange that, F1 is equal to FR plus F2. So that is equal to 6.3 kilometers. And that is what F1 is equal to. Weight, type of force. Weight is mass times the gravitational field strength. Gravitational field strength is G. If you're near the Earth's surface, which you are right now, then G is 9.8 meters per second, uh, newtons per kilogram, sorry, newtons per kilogram. 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Let's take an object in free fall with no drag. W equals mg, that's the weight. It's accelerating at A. There's no drag, so the only force is the weight. Therefore, the resultant force is equal to the weight, which is equal to mg. You follow me so far? Yeah? Well, fr, the result force, is also equal to na. Therefore, mg equals ma. This is in the absence of drag. So the m's cancel out, because the mass is the same in both cases. We're talking about the same mass. Therefore, A equals G. That's why the acceleration of free form is taken as 9.81 in the absence of drag. Okay, that's where it comes from. Alright, so that's weight. And uh, just an explanation of why the acceleration of free form we take as 9.81. There are different ideas about what happens in free form. You need to know two of them, the two classic examples. Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC. Right, so he's a he's a very old bloke. Well, actually, he lived a very long time ago. He was a Greek philosopher. He said you get a larger acceleration of free fall for larger masses. Now, Aristotle. He is an intellectual giant. You don't disagree with Aristotle unless you have a very, very good reason to disagree. So no one disagreed for a very long time. Until that was that Galileo came along. Galileo, 1564 to 1642, in Italy. Right? And he, said, he disagreed. He said the acceleration of free fall is independent of mass. However, you must neglect air resistance for that. It's important that you appreciate that air resistance must be neglected for Galileo, Galileo's idea to be true, to be correct. Experimentation proves Galileo to be correct on this. Now, as I said, Aristotle, he's an intellectual giant. You don't disagree with him unless you have very good reason to. And then, hence, Galileo coming along and saying that acceleration of free fall is independent of mass. So that means that a large mass and a small mass would have the same acceleration of free fall. That was very controversial. He was a controversial bloke. He had other controversial ideas at the time as well, to do with the solar system. But that's beyond the scope of today. Experimentation, such as dropping two different masses. The classic example is dropping two masses 
They have different mass, but approximately the same size. So you could use like a copper ball and a lead ball. They have different densities, so even if you make them the same size, they have different masses. Drop them off the Tower of Pisa. Apparently, Galileo didn't actually do this experiment, but his students did. And then we just drop them off at the same time, and then you listen. And if you hear one thud, that means they landed at the same time, and therefore must have the same acceleration of freefall. If you do that experiment, that's indeed what you get, but pretty much within a good margin of error. So that experiment proves it. Also, during the Apollo missions, they tested this on the moon. Do you remember the experiment? I said that was fake. Is it what? I said that was fake. You said it's fake, yeah, maybe it was fake, who you knows? Uh, well, anyway, let's assume that they did go to the moon. I'm not, uh, I do believe in the lunar landings, alright? So if you don't, uh, we disagree. They, when they were on the moon, and I believe they were, they dropped what? Even though it was fake, what do you think it was? A feather and a hammer, right? Now, if you dropped a feather and a hammer on Earth, but you know what's going to happen, right? The hammer's going to hit the ground a long time before the feather. The feather's barely going to have left your hand. But they dropped it on the moon. There's no, well, there's no significant atmosphere, at least on the moon. There's no, no atmosphere. So, and they both hit the surface at the same time. So, the experimentation, hopefully, you can experimentation proves that Galileo is like correct. This is actually consistent with F equals MA in the absence of drag, kind of related to what I just showed you when I looked at weight. If you have no drag, then the resultant force is equal to MG. Let's say you've got a larger mass, okay, so you've got a larger weight, that gives you a larger resultant force, right? Well, also, A is equal to F divided by M. So if you have a larger mass, you have a smaller acceleration, and those two changes will cancel each other out. So it is consistent with F equals MA in the absence of drag. That, what this means is even a feather and a hammer, the instant that I drop them in the Earth's atmosphere, when they experience zero drag, but just at the instant that I drop them, then they will have the same acceleration of freefall. But then, very promptly, the drag force will become dominant for the feather. Because it's designed to trap air and have a very high drag force. That's the function of the feather. Whereas the hammer, the, the air resistance is not going to be dominant at all. The weight is. So, at the instant they're dropping, that's so exposure for people. But after that, Alright, so we've looked at motion, looked at motion graphs, super equations, force and how that relates to acceleration. Is everyone happy so far? You're like, yeah, we're pros at this by now. Well, let's look at projectiles. This is the student's number one favourite subject. <laughs> uh, what is a projectile? It's an object that falls under the influence of gravity. And we generally speaking, do not consider drag for these. But we, you may, as an explanation question after doing a projectile question, be asked to explain how your value would change if drag was not neglected. That would be a possible question. Simultaneously, you have constant velocity in one direction, which is horizontal, in the horizontal direction, and constant acceleration in a perpendicular direction, which is vertical. So horizontal, vertical, perpendicular. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. It's nice to do three angles between the two. Um, let's take a projectile at an instant of time. <coughs> There's our projectile at an instant of time. It's just an object, it's got a velocity v. That's what, that's what it, our projectile is. The velocity vector has components, v vertical, v horizontal. So we're breaking things down into components. We're all good at that, aren't we? We've just seen what happens in those cases. v 
VH, this component, remains constant throughout the flight time of the projectile because constant velocity in one direction. There's no force, no resultant force acting in the horizontal direction to cause it to change. We just looked at that, didn't we? F equals MA. You need a resultant force to produce an acceleration. There's no drag, so there's no force, uh, or no, no resultant force producing an acceleration in that direction, or deceleration in that direction. And VV changes throughout the flight time of the projectile. This one changes. And that one could be positive or negative. It could be positive if it's going up, negative when it's coming back down. So V, H, constant. V, V is changing all the time. The weight is what causes this to change. So the fact it's got weight, no other forces, that means you've got a result of force equal to the weight and that will produce an acceleration. And because the acceleration is vertical, it can only affect that component. The acceleration is, is vertical, it can only affect that component. It can't affect that one, it's perpendicular to it. If your drag was not neglected, when you do calculations it is neglected, but if it were not neglected, for, so this is for the explanation questions, then this would no longer be constant, and it will decrease during the flight time of the, project, of the projectile. This will get smaller. That means it won't travel as far. Well, it's one of the reasons, anyway. Also, you'll have, on the way up, the, the drag force will be working against the velocity alongside the uh, acceleration of free fall. So this will get smaller quicker on the way up. That means it won't go as high as it would do. And on the way down, that will uh, increase at a slower rate as well. So that may actually elongate the flight time slightly but not very much. The net effect is your projectile will not go as high as it would do and it won't go as far. So it won't go as far because this is getting smaller and because it reaches a smaller maximum height so the actual time in the air is smaller as well. Alright, that's an introduction to projectiles. How do you go about solving that? Oh, whoops, I do apologise. So I'm projectiles. Because you've got constant velocity, uh, I think I'm missing an S there. Yes. Sorry? Go for it. Horizontal velocity. Okay. Right. UH constant throughout, so you've got constant velocity, so UH stays the same. I don't know why I put the T there. Constant, constant velocity means you use S equals UT. UV, so in the vertical direction, you've got constant acceleration. Therefore, you need to use the SUVAT equations to solve what happens in the vertical direction. So in vertical, use SUVAT. And I've labelled everything, whether it's vertical or not. Because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, you don't need to label that one. And the time is the same for both of them, because it's a scalar. The acceleration is always equal to 9.81, because you're neglecting drag. And it always acts downwards. Now that may mean, in some cases, it needs to be a positive value. If the velocity, if your velocity initially is horizontal, so you've got horizontal projection, then you take acceleration of free fall as positive because you haven't got anything going up. So you haven't got anything going in the opposite direction. So you can take A as positive then. But generally speaking, your initial velocity will be up, so you're going to have to have and something negative because something's going up, something's going down. So you take up as positive, down as negative, for example. Time is a scalar, so it's the same for both the horizontal and vertical aspects of the motion. 
It took a certain amount of time for the projectile to get there. So therefore the time taken to cover SH is the same as the time taken to cover SG. It can't be in two places at the same time. So the time must be the same for both the horizontal and vertical components of the ocean. It's always a good idea when you're solving projectiles to methodically work through distinguishing between your horizontal calculations and your vertical calculations. And when you're doing the vertical ones, you write out your SUVAT and what the values are that you know. It's always a good idea to work methodically rather than trying to leap ahead, do two steps in one, and make mistakes in that, by doing that. So my advice is to do it nice and methodically. General projectiles are ones that are projected at an angle theta to the horizontal at velocity u. And therefore, because it's projected at angle theta, you've got a horizontal and a vertical component for your velocity. The horizontal component of the velocity, uh, is u cos theta. That's just using trigonometry to work that out. And that doesn't change. So the horizontal component of velocity is always equal to u cos theta. The vertical component is u sine theta, and that will change. The trajectory is symmetrical. So that means that the time it took to get to the top is half of the total flight time. And the change in the vertical component of the velocity up there is the same as the change in the velocity going down there. At maximum height, the vertical component of the velocity is zero. So right down at the top, the vertical component is zero. That means that your velocity vector is horizontal at that point, and it's equal to uh, because it's just purely horizontal, so it's actually equal at that point in time. So that gives you a good reference point to help you solve problems. Uh, you can find the max height because vertical component velocity is zero and that's half of the total flight time. Always go and watch out for the half. That's a general projectile, one that's launched at some angle, theta. Then there are special cases. You have vertical projection. In this case, uh is equal to zero. There is no horizontal component because it's launched perfectly vertical. There's nothing to, no force to cause it to change direction and gain the uh. And therefore, the vertical component of the velocity, the initial component, is equal to whatever velocity it's projected at. Then you have horizontal projection as well. Oh, just going back to the vertical projection. When this one is at maximum height, the velocity equals zero. Because you remember on the previous example, we said at maximum height, the vertical component is zero, isn't it? So therefore, if it's only got a vertical component and that's zero, then this is actually at zero velocity in total. Then horizontal projection, as I was just going on to say. Well, this time the vertical component the vertical initial component is zero, therefore the horizontal component of velocity is equal to the velocity that it's projected at. So it's equal to u. And that follows this. This is actually, this trajectory is half of a full projectile. Imagine your, your full projectile be signed off over here, going up, so it's like it's just got to maximum height. And then it will continue down. Very common to use that value, whatever that may be, 10 meters per second, 100 meters per second, for the initial vertical velocity. Very common. But the initial vertical velocity is zero, so you must be careful of that. That's what I said. Let's do some example calculations. Example vertical calculation. So this is a vertical projectile 
launched at 11 meters per second. Calculate the maximum height. It's vertical projection. UH is zero, so there's no horizontal motion to consider. So we'll do a SUVAT, write down your SUVAT. S is what we want to find, question mark. You notice I haven't bothered putting the subscript V in here because I, it's only vertical, nothing interesting happening in horizontal, so forget the subscripts. U plus 11. It's going up, I've taken up as positive. I'm, I'm making clear my positives and negatives in these examples. V, at maximum height, the velocity is zero. A, minus 9.8. It's 9.8, obviously, but it's acting down. The amount of times that students say gravity acts upwards. Anyway, that is your SUVAT. We don't need to know T, because I've got my three quantities that I know, and the one that I don't know. So I've got four quantities involved. Now you've got to choose an equation. It is v squared equals u squared plus 2as, because it's the only one that hasn't got t in it. Now, first thing I can do is, whenever you have something that's zero, that means you can get something out of the equation straight away, and you've got an easier equation to rearrange. So then, s is equal to minus u squared over 2a. You notice the minus. Minus has to be there. It's in there in the equation because if I take this over to the other side, that's minus u squared equals 2as. That's important because I'm going to end up with a negative over a negative. Put your values in. Well, u 11 squared is 121 over 2 times minus 9.8. See, the, the g was down. So, or well, the A was down, so I've got minus 9.8. Minus over minus, giving me a positive value, that's good. 6.2, the fact that it's positive actually tells me something. What does it tell me? It's up, yeah. So, up, that's good. That confirms what I was expecting. Great. Right. Are you all confident with the first school projection questions? Yeah. I mean, they are just see that problem, so it's nice and easy. What about a horizontal calculation? A bullet is fired horizontally at 300 meters per second from a rifle at a height of 1.5 meters. Calculate the maximum range. When the word range is used, it means horizontal distance here. So that's someone, I don't know, is that a tall person, a short person? No, someone standing up and shooting. All right. Now here, if you look at the horizontal data you've got, we, that's the one we want to find, SH. UH 300, and the T is also unknown. We don't know how long it's in the air for. That means we've got two unknowns and only one equation. Therefore, because we haven't got enough information to solve with one equation, we now, now need to consider the vertical motion. That's the rule in maths, you know, two unknowns, how many equations do you need? Two. Two. Three unknowns, three equations, yeah, so we've got two unknowns here, so we need another equation. And luckily for us, the T is involved in the vertical motion, so that gives us a way to solve what T is, then we can find out what SH is. So let's write down our vertical data, SV. 1.5, so starting off at a height of 1.5. U is 0. V, we don't know what vertical velocity it hits the ground with, we get it. A plus 9.8, remember I said for horizontal projection, you can take A as positive. So that's what we do, and then T is the unknown here. So we need an equation, SU, AT, S equals UT plus a half AT squared. Right, take that. U was zero, therefore UT equals zero. That makes our equation easier to rearrange because otherwise you get all these pluses and minuses and horrible stuff like that. So T is square root of 2S over A, which 
which is the square root of 2 times 1.5 over 9.8, that gives us 0.55 seconds. So we've now found out how long the bullet is in the air for. And we know how fast it's going, horizontally. So now we can go back to our equation, put the time in, that should be, I know it's fine as you, because it's horizontal projection. So 300 times 0.55, that gives us a range of 165 metres away. So if you're at 170 metres, you're safe. They can't shoot you, unless they aim up. Alright, so 165 metres. Any questions on that one? Lovely. And then a general projectile question. This one's less relevant. This one's a football one, right? You know, like, how Tottenham strikers are so good. Apparently they did really well over the weekend. Well, apparently they lost, and uh, Arsenal fans were rubbing it in my face. You know, I'm not that much of a die-hard fan, so don't worry. <coughs> you can't hurt my feelings. I'm a Spurs fan. Yeah, I'm a Spurs fan. Right, the striker kicks a football. Good or bad, we don't know. That's what we're going to find out. He kicks it at an angle of he or she. You know, it could be a she. At an angle of 38 degrees for horizontal, and at a velocity of 12 meters per second. Whether that's fast or not, who knows? Let's find out. The striker was 10 meters away from the goal, and the goal has a height of 2 meters. Is that a bit higher? I'm, I'm sort of estimating it's a bit higher than someone that's short like me. Yeah, is that about right? 8 feet. 8 feet? 8 feet tall. So 8 times 0.3. 2.4? Oh, that's a bit of a short goal then. Hey, this keeper's got an easy job. So did the striker score? That's the question. So it's travelling at 12 metres per second. Now that's the initial velocity at 38 degrees to the horizontal. Well, UH and UV, we need to find those out first. So we use trigonometry to do that. So UH is 12 times cos 38, that's 9.46. 12 sine 38 gives us 7.39. So that's the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity. Let's find the time taken for the ball to reach the, the goal. So this is the, this, the time taken to travel that horizontal distance, because we know they're 10 metres away. So SH is UH times T. T is SH over UH. 1.05 seconds. So this keeper's got plenty of time to respond. Now let's write down our vertical information. SV, we don't know. What we need to find out here is what height is the ball at by the time it reaches the goal? We want it to be less than what? Two. We want it to be less than two metres to make sure it goes in. UV. That's 7.39, like that out earlier. We don't know what vertical component of velocity is at the goal. We don't need to know either. A is minus 9.8. Note, ball is going up, acceleration is going down, so we've got a negative involved. The time, we just worked that out, 1.05. Equation, S equals ut plus a half at squared, our good friend there. Uh, put the values in, 9.46 times 1.05, blah, blah, blah. And we get a height of 2.36 metres. By the way, just stating that is not answering the question. What should we state as the answer? Hey? No, no, it's not a numerical answer. It's No, they did not score the goal. Because the I said, did the striker score? Did you? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, the ball went over the crossbar, so he didn't score. It went over. Oh, it's the keeper's huh? The keeper didn't have to do any work. The keeper just like... <laughs> right, so that is my, cal my calculation for the general projectile. Was there any point you would like me to cover? I you know, the calculations or anything else. This one. Okay. This is the vertical motion. 
This is the horizontal velocity, 9.46. So not that one. This is the vertical, this is the initial vertical velocity, so that's why it needs to 7.39. Alright? Yeah, you just got to be careful you don't muddle the uh, velocity. And your calculations are micro velocity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. That is absolutely shocking. So you just want. Fire this man! Fire this man! Alright. Okay, yeah, so there was a mistake there. Call me out. I put that there deliberately, did you not notice? <laughs> classic, classic teach of the line, right? Alright, yeah, thanks for explaining that. I'll have to redo my whole calculation.